Good afternoon. My name is Pat Daniels and I'm the Executive Director of the Constructing Hope Pre-Apprenticeship Training Program. I cannot tell you how honored I am to have you join us for our very first virtual event. Today I'm excited that we're going to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion in the construction industry. Um, we're going to do that today with my board chairman, Mel Jones. I am honored that he's able to join us and he's going to be the MC for our program today and share with you what's going to happen next. Great, thanks Pat. Um, as you know, uh, this program is extremely important to me. Uh, it's very personal to me and my family, uh, but it's also what I do. I am the diversity, equity, and inclusion manager for JE Dunn Construction. I've been doing this work for a little bit over 10 years, so I'm very proud to be a part of what I do as well as this program. But let me introduce you to a few other things that are going to go on through the rest of this program. Uh, we're going to have some fantastic speakers. We're going to first hear from Jerry Jones, who is one of our graduates. And he's going to talk about what he's gone through, and his experience with the program, and how it's helped him in his life. So after we hear from Jerry, we're going to have our keynote speaker, who's Johnny C. Taylor Jr. And he's from Sherm. And he's going to talk to you all about inclusion, equity, and diversity. That's the perspective that he likes to come from. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from him and you all hearing his presentation. But let me remind you all while you're out there that on the right hand side of your screen, there's gonna be a little button for you to donate all the way through this program. If you have other things to do, we don't want you to miss the opportunity to go ahead and sponsor this wonderful program that we're presenting to you. But before that happens, we would like to go ahead and move on forward with the rest of this program and start off by introducing you to a couple of our um, industry partners. One is John C. Cresswell. Uh, he's with Hoffman Construction. One of our longtime partners since the inception of the program. Absolutely. Fantastic partner. And then the other is Tawana Hennessy, who's new to our board from the Northwest Carpenters, but a fantastic addition to the team. Great addition. Again, PNCI. So we call them another partner who's been with our program since inception. Great. So hold on, sit back and relax, and watch the rest of this program. We're excited to have you here with us today. Hi, I'm John Criswell. I'm the HR manager for Hoffman Structures Incorporated. I serve on the Constructing Hope board alongside with Dave Drinkward, our president. I've uh, been with Constructing Hope for three plus years now, and Hoffman themselves have been with Constructing Hope for roughly 15 years or more. We've had several people involved with Constructing Hope, and I wanna go into the part of our relationship and why we believe so heavily on what they're doing here at this pre-apprenticeship program. Sure, they do a great job of working with all these individuals that are coming from a past that is colorful, but also with the attitude of wanting to change that past and move forward in their lives. That is one of the best things that has ever happened in my life is to be part of this board. And the interesting thing about it is, I didn't even know I would wanna be involved. I met Pat roughly, like I said, three and a half years ago, and she introduced Constructing Hope to me at that time. So I kind of started to get to know it. And at the time I was also interviewing uh, workers to come onto our projects. And I just met this young lady by the name of Hope Kidby. And she came into my office and she had her great resume from her pre-apprenticeship program. And she was looking to get her first job now as an apprentice carpenter in the union. And she had met with me and when I met with her, I had a really great feeling about Hope. Her attitude was just cheerful. Her name suits her well because she brings a smile of Hope. And when she was there, I asked her, I said, what have you been doing? Where have you been working, Hope? And she's like, I haven't been working. I wanna get my foot in the door so I can start working. And I said, that's great. I said, so what do you do in your off time? She's like, I volunteer. I volunteer down in Portland with helping the homeless. And when she said that she was volunteering to keep herself busy, I knew this was somebody that needed to be a, on the Hoffman Structures team. Another great thing about Constructing Hope is the diversity it can bring within a company, even such as my own. Like I said, when I started here three and a half years ago, I never knew that I needed to be looking at how diversified we needed to be as a company. But after being educated and being involved with Constructing Hope, I've learned that there's people that need more than just that, more than an understanding mind. They need a voice, they need a person to be there by their side to help them identify the things that help them continue to move forward in their career. Hi, my name is Tawana Hennessy, and I'm the Community and Outreach Representative for Northwest Carpenters Union, and I recently joined the Constructing Hope Board of Directors. 
The mission at Northwest Carpenters is to improve relationship within communities of color, to change the negative narrative, and also to remove barriers that have been put in place to hold back women and people of color. Carpenters is very intentional about um, diversifying, or I should say removing the diversity gap and expanding opportunities for everyone. We at Northwest Carpenters believe in constructing hope, and that's why we choose to continue our relationship with Constructing Hope. Constructing Hope provides opportunities for a group or a population that is underserved, for a population that is looked over, for a population who some want to define them by the worst mistake that they've made. But Constructing Hope does exactly that. It reconstructs a young person's life and gives them new hope. We have had over a hundred participants that have graduated from Constructing Hope and gone on to be very successful through Northwest Carpenters. Some of them have um, gone on to have some leadership roles and for that we are very proud. Thanks John and Tawana. Those are some wonderful words that you all had to share. And I wanna thank our industry, our industry partners because without them, we couldn't have this program. The training they do, the facilities that they help us with, the education that they help provide and the dollars we wouldn't be able to have this program. And speaking of dollars, our sponsor for today is at the bottom of the screen. When you go about your life, thank them because we're able to do this event today because of them. And now to the meat of the event, I wanna introduce you all to Jerry Jones, one of our graduates from 2010. Jerry, take it away. Hi, my name is Gary Jones. I'm the owner of Garen Energy LLC. It goes back to a place, I wanna say high school is when I was in high school, I went to Benson High School. And when I was there, that's when I started my electrical journey. Tim Harishu was my instructor, who was a really solid instructor. He's still a big advocate for me to this day. But I dabbled in it for a little bit, but my passion was really towards baseball. So I thought I was gonna have a pro baseball career for a while, but that didn't turn out. So I ended up working at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I was at 1-800-GOT-JUNK for approximately, I wanna say about five years lost my grandma, lost a lot of friends, changed perspective. A friend of mine who just recently passed away, um, Adam, he told me about a pre-apprenticeship program called Constructing Hope that he was in. And so I kind of looked into it and I thought it might be a good idea. At the time I didn't have a car, I didn't have anything. I had, I had four felonies. <laughs> I was back at my mom's house. So when I first started going to Constructing Hope, I started out on a skateboard. I knew I wanted to get back into electricity somehow and I knew this would be a way. I was over a 3.0 student in high school, so like math was kind of my strong suit. So when I saw the opportunity for Solar City to have an interview, I jumped at it and I interviewed for that at Constructing Hope. And that's when I met a man named Nick Armstrong. And Nick Armstrong was pretty impressed with what he saw. He tested me, interviewed me. Then he grandfathered me straight into Area 1, JATC, and that's where I started my apprenticeship. Looking at all the requirements for that program, like I knew it was gonna be difficult and I was gonna be dedicating the next four years of my life to something. When I first started there, I was, I was not ready for studying. I wasn't, I wasn't good at preparing for anything. What it really got down to it is I was surrounding myself with a whole lot of peers that weren't really as supportive as they should be. So I had to start getting like a tunnel vision and zoning out like everything that I was doing. I, I like stopped hanging out late. I went to bed early. <laughs> I focused on my relationship with my partner and like 100%. Once I started doing that and focusing on everything that truly mattered to me, that's when things started going the right direction. It just started like coming, like Nick Armstrong showed up and like, like I said, he's been one of my big advocates in life, but it's like everything, getting all the, everything expunged off my record in the minimum time allowed and staying focused, that, that helped out tremendously. So I did the uh, apprenticeship in the four years, became a journeyman, tested out. It, it is about the values and it's about the relationships that you, you build with people. And it doesn't matter if they're people that are helping you, it could be the customer and just having a conversation with them and learning their history. It's, that's what it's truly all about. And, and so over this time, like, so all I did is focus on being the best me I could be and being 
genuine and, and caring and understanding with everybody that I was talking to, even the people that some people would overlook and look past, it was like, I'll give you the time. I was like, I'll give you your chance. I worked, I worked a job. I worked a, a job at Tesla because Tesla ended up buying Solar City, and Elon Musk owns Tesla and everybody knows the great things. I had a lot of great benefits from this company and they put me in a really great position to where I was able to transfer over into my own company eventually. Get to now, eight years into the electrical trade, you get to a point where you can become a master electrician or what they call a signing supervisor in Oregon. So I was like, let's take that journey. Like, what's next? Give me the next thing. I'm an electrical contractor. So to work as an electrician, you have to be licensed as an apprentice or a journeyman in the state of Oregon. You have to follow the ratios. However, I wasn't in the position to go and hire an electrician. I wasn't able to be a, able to be a training agent to be able to hire an apprentice on. So I was stuck working by myself. Right now, my first apprentice is an old high school friend of mine. And he reached out a while back ago and I saw his drive. So I was like, I'm gonna remember you in a year when it's time, I'm gonna let you know and I'm gonna hit you up and it's gonna, we're gonna be ready. And he was, and he was working at a company for, I believe like, it's like over 10 years and he put in his two weeks and he's like, I'm ready to do this. And I'm like, let's go. So he's on board now and I'm feeling good with the direction everything's going. I'm, I'm a training agent now, area one. And I just got approved for that. And that's how I was able to grandfather my buddy straight in without putting him on a waiting list. So as far as constructing hope was like one of my biggest mentors in life was a man named Sam Riggins, who was our math instructor back then. And I just reached out to him a couple months ago because I was freaking out. I was like, how do I give back? What can I do? I called Pat. Everybody remembered me as Jerry, but I made sure they remember who Gary is. And I'm like, I, I got this. And it's, I was like, I want to come back. I want to talk to, to the youth or anybody else that thought they were at a dead end and say, you can turn it around. I mean, I was four felonies deep. So now that I got my own business, like to be honest, my son started playing soccer and I haven't, I haven't had to miss practices. I get to see all the games. I'm there for everything. I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day. If my wife needs me, I can come help her out. I, I really want to like put the importance on family. And like when I talked about my cousin building the website and how the name Garen is my son's name and how I came from renewable energy in Solar City. And that's why I gave my electrical company an energy name and named it after my son, who is my future generation, because I wanted people to remember like, this is the future, pay attention to it. And that's why renewable energy is so important. And the hand inside of my logo right here, if you saw it in color, I, I took a picture of my wife's hand and said, you're gonna be holding the world because like she does, she's, she's my rock. She's there for everything. And it's just us three, like that's what I get up every day for is all, all of us and like, it's working. It's working really good. Thank you, Jerry. We definitely appreciate hearing your story. Jerry is absolutely a testament to the program and a testament to the change that Constructing Hope could bring to your life. Not just to his life, but what he brought to his entire family. So again, as you're watching this program, please remember that button on the right. Click it, because we could really use your donations. Now I get the wonderful pleasure to introduce you all to our keynote speaker. Johnny C. Taylor Jr. is the president and CEO of SHRM and to hear his perspective on inclusion, equity, diversity is extremely refreshing. And I look forward for you all to hear this same message. Johnny, take it away. Welcome and thank you. I wanna thank you to all of my friends at Constructing Hope. Let me start by acknowledging your amazing work, specifically the pre-apprenticeship program. With that program, you help the long-term unemployed attain sustainable careers, you increase workforce diversity, you reduce recidivism, and you also meet the hiring needs of the construction industry. That's, that's just amazing, a win-win-win situation. And it's clear, most importantly from a SHRM perspective, is that we are aligned with our missions. Much of what we advocate for daily is what you're doing every day as well. So thank you. We actually believe here at SHRM that when people succeed, businesses thrive and society benefits. Right now, we are arriving at a very important point in time where business is realizing that they can no longer afford to leave talent on the bench. We just can't afford that luxury. 
Our long-held biases have prevented business and society from moving forward. The case for diversity, that word that we're all talking about right, right now in the workforce, has never been stronger as organizations seek to attract, employ, and retain the best talent. And we're going to do it regardless of demographic identity or background. And let me tell you why this is so important. It starts with the 2020 census. The 2020 U.S. Census highlights the impending sea change in America's demographics. Did you know, for example, for the first time, though still the largest racial group, the white population has decreased? And the number of people identified as multiracial has more than tripled in the last decade. And that means diversity is a coming. It's inevitable. And as a result, we need to focus a lot on inclusion and equity. The census tells us where this country is going in terms of demographics, but we have to remain committed to pushing for inclusion, equity, and diversity in the workplace. We call it IED. Talking about IE&D, let's talk about a population. Let's talk about a topic that's near and dear to our hearts, second chances. Perhaps the greatest challenge on the IE&D front is the hiring of people with criminal records. Yes, this is greater than in all of the other categories because regrettably, people of color, LGBTQ individuals, and people with histories of abuse or, or, or mental illness account for a disproportionate share of people with criminal backgrounds. And when people with criminal records are, are excluded from the workforce, a large, willing, trainable talent source goes to waste. In fact, one third of U.S. adults, and we all know the numbers, have a criminal record. By the way, that's eerily similar to those who have college degrees. We also know that 700,000 people will be released from prison annually in our country and that we, their unemployment rate is five times the national average. Without employment and financial security, reintegration into society will be extremely difficult for these folks, and, and many will find themselves back behind bars as a result. Unfortunately, we have built an enormous criminal justice enterprise where we identify, apprehend, prosecute, and warehouse people, but we've invested relatively little back into their reintegration into our communities. So I want to talk about the pathways to restoration. For most, those pathways are narrow and, and, not far, and, and, and for many of these folks, it's actually non-existent. That requires, if we're going to overcome that, that we shed our own personal biases. And we need to do it through the lens of empathy, something that we talk about a lot here at SHRM. Not to be confused with sympathy, but empathy. Imagine how a family member of yours would feel if they were being locked out of the workplace because of a mistake that they made. Imagine how you would feel if you made that mistake, that one day that you made a mistake and then forever you now have a criminal record and it keeps you out of the workplace. We need to remove the barriers that stigmatize second chance hiring and make it hard for employers to hire. Talking about promoting the success of second chance hiring goes a long way to humanize people with criminal histories and eliminate the stigma of hiring them. Now, after shedding our biases, we can start to create avenues for the convicted and, and formerly incarcerated to successfully re-enter society after they paid their debt. But we first must be willing to consider hiring employees with criminal records. It starts with that. 85% of people report a willingness to work with someone with a criminal conviction. Now, for this pathway to be sustainable, it is crucial that we invest in people's training and development. Stop and think for a second. You have people who've been behind bars for 10, 12, 20 years, and we bringing them into the workplace requires that we've got to catch them up. Time has passed, many of them. Listen, now is a critically important moment to unlock opportunity for these folks to set a better course for their futures. And this isn't just about them, it's also about benefiting business. You see, when done right, second chance hiring is also a much needed win for business. The reality is we have a talent deficit. 
We closed the month of June with 10 million U.S. job openings. We need every willing, ready, and able person to come into the workforce. Again, we don't have the luxury to just exclude people. Recruiting individuals with criminal backgrounds opens pools of talent with willing and trainable candidates, and it strengthens the American workforce. 80% of hiring managers rate the quality of work of employees with criminal records as high or higher than their counterparts. So this isn't just doing it because, you know, kumbaya make people feel good. This is good for business. And we also know that they retain longer and are especially loyal workers. So this is very, very good. But it can't be lost upon us. It's good for the individual. It's good for business. But it's also good for society. Creating better opportunities for these deserving individuals also provides them with, a better, with, with better options to contribute positively to society. We know recidivism drops dramatically when people with criminal backgrounds have meaningful work. We know that their families are better. We know that their communities are safer. This is really, really important. We, we look at, listen, if they're working, they're spending. And this positively impacts GDP. This, this is good for all of us. And again, when we're trying to break this vicious cycle of poverty, it's a win, win, win. So join us in getting talent back to work. This is precisely why Sherm, in partnership with the Koch Industries, created a campaign, a platform, an initiative to help give qualified individuals with criminal records a fair shake at gainful employment. The initiative also offers guidance. It's not enough to just tell you to do it. We're going to show you how to do it. We want business and HR leaders uh, who are considering hiring this traditionally overlooked talent pool for the first time to have the resources to do it the right way. Together, we must end outdated, non-inclusive hiring practices. Let's give those with criminal histories a fair chance at employment, provide economic opportunity and advancement for all, and build a more equitable economy and society. When the convicted are put in a cage, a door is closed. For most, that door is opened, and they are ultimately and eventually going to be released. All too often, unfortunately, another door remains forever closed. And that closed door is a door to opportunity, a door to dignity, a door to hope. Bringing this talent back to work not only restores their lives and their livelihoods, it also restores our own communities. It brings us better workers to build a better workplace, to create a better world. Thanks, Johnny, for that wonderful keynote speech. There are several things that he said in there that I hope you all got to listen to. One was 700,000 people are returning every year from incarceration. 700,000. Constructing Hope can only service 100. One third of the population out there has a record. That's the same number of people that have college degrees. That's a huge problem. There's a lot of talent sitting on the bench with that group of 700,000 individuals. And the fact that we haven't tapped into that talent as a society is a huge miss. Constructing Hope has started that first step. And your donations on the right side of this screen will help us try to increase that number. Again, 700,000 people, we can only service 100. But with your donations, we can do more to make those people feel a valuable part of this society. And again, raise all the ships in the dock. Thanks again, Johnny. Hey Mel, sorry to interrupt you, it's Courtney. I just wanted to be sure our attendees know about a fun little incentive we have today. Anyone who donates at $1,000 or more will receive a copy of Johnny C. Taylor Jr.'s new book, Reset. Donations can be made on the right-hand portion of your screen. Mel, as you mentioned, a donation to Constructing Hope is truly an investment into our community. So, but let's move forward with the rest of the presentation. And, and Pat, while we have you here, why don't you give us a little bit of what's going on with the mission of Constructing Hope? And then after you maybe touch on the mission, um, maybe you can touch on the roots, you know, where the program started from and how it's so strong today. Okay, I'm gonna start backwards. Let's start okay. with the roots. The roots of the issue started with Irvington Covenant Church back in 1995 where they saw a lot of African-American men were standing outside selling drugs. When we went over and talked to these men, we found out that everyone had a felony background and could not find employment. So we decided to research and see what area could they go into that would not uh, look at their felony background. We found that construction was the only industry that did that. 
So with that being said, we got to work with Hoffman, with the carpenters, and tried to create a curriculum that we got certified by the Bureau of Labor and Industry to start a pre-apprenticeship training program. Okay. So, but the history of the program began with us focusing on formerly incarcerated because having a felony background, we found construction was the only place that they could find employment. Hoffman stepped up to the plate with us, the Pacific Northwest Carpenter stepped up to the plate with us to help create a curriculum so that we could create an, an avenue for them to enter the construction field. We would make jokes about fathers, brothers, and in-laws, mm -hmm. and how do we compete with fathers, brothers, and in-laws? And we Ex said that had to be skilled. Explain that. And you said that, but you say fathers, fathers brothers, and in-laws. Explain what that means in the construction okay. In the construction industry, the, it, there's been a pattern of how do you come through the ranks is if your father was doing this work, he's going to just bring you in. He brought his cousins in. And it's just a, a pathway of how to get into the trades. Without that father, brother, or in-law um, pathway, the general public doesn't have a way to get in. And it's how do you compete? If you've never been introduced to doing plumbing and say your dad was a plumber, you know everything about plumbing because you've done this with your dad. If I've never been introduced to it, I don't even know that that's an avenue. So first we have to introduce you to the trades and we, we give you certifications and training. And as you use your hands and do this, people find out that it's something that I really, really like doing. And guess what? Not only can you like doing it, you make a lot of money doing it. The construction industry is one of the highest paying industries when you look at how to create generational wealth. And it teaches you a trade that carries with you forever. Forever. So is that worth a college degree? Or is it equal to a college degree? I think it was the first college. And then we created college. Right. Thank you. That's pretty much fantastic. Um, can you touch on the role that Constructing Hope plays in diversifying this industry? Because I work in it and my job is full time. Show us what you're doing. Well, what we're doing is our, our role is to diversify the trades. When we looked at this program and we looked at the trades and just understanding who is there, and now that the workers are retiring at such an early age, there's such a gap for employment. So this is a group of people who are extremely um, anxious. anxious to get to work and to start a career. Having this opportunity, it's twofold. It's we're filling the gap in the construction industry to help them diversify the industry, first of all, but also it's changing the economy so that people who have been in prison, we pay for the folks in prison. Now they're coming out and becoming paying citizens. And it kind of like brings up the whole shit, right? So you got all these people coming out, they're all getting good jobs. They're talking to their other folks that are in prison coming out, they're getting good jobs. It actually increases the whole stability of the entire population, right? And it creates community. our own fathers, brothers, and in-laws. Sounds fantastic. Yes, because we do have that now. Uh, we have had several graduates. When the sons see what the fathers are doing, they're following suit. I so, think I've had several of them all on my job site. Yes, you have. The father and the two sons out on our job site working. And I'll tell you, that's an absolute pleasure when you can look at and see that dynamic happening. And the dynamic is we're stopping the, the rate of recidivism mm -hmm. for those folks going back to prison, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty high. We read some statistics that said 18% um, probably recidivate immediately, but overall there's about a 60% that at some point they're going to be returning to jail only because they don't have a place to go. So this way we're solving two problems. We're stopping the gap of the recidivism, we're having putting families together to have livable wages, and we're diversifying the trades in building diversity and inclusion. What do we need from the folks to help us make this happen? Well, we need an investment. This program is not free. It's free to the individual. But when we look at how we put people through this program, it's about $12,500. But we're not, this is not just for training. Once we train our, our participants, we ask them for a three-year commitment. When you're going into construction, we talked about it being similar to college. They need to have support for the first two years. And if you're at your father's house, you've got support for a lifetime. So if you're on your own, we have to become that father for these guys and give them that first two years of support. If you know anything about the trades, your first year, you're on and off the job. You know, you're working for a month or two, you're training, you're gonna go back to the hall, get some more classes in and you go back out to work. This is where we can fill the gap to make sure that they are staying focused, help them financially until they get to that next spot because we still have bills to pay during that time that we're laid off and sometimes unemployment is not enough. Okay. But this program fills the gap that by the time they're third term apprentice, we've got you financially set with financial management. 
you have bank account, you know how to, to budget. Not only that, we're building your skills so that you can also become leaders in the industry. So I have a, 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 an interesting question. What role does Constructing Hope play in helping us diversify the constructing industry? When I think about Constructing Hope and the people that we serve, they're formerly incarcerated. When you look at the prison system, it is uh, mostly black and brown people, mostly men, and today a lot of women. The stats today are showing more and more women are being incarcerated. So when we look at the prison system and when we look at the construction industry, people are being released from prison with no place to go, but yet they have all the skills and the, the aptitude that in their hearts, they want to start a career. So this is a win-win if they're interested in construction to have this avenue so that we're diversifying the, the, the unions and non-union construction trades, as well as people who are coming from prison are not recidivating because they have a career choice that they're going to. And the great thing in that is that we're seeing, as we make jokes about the fathers, brothers, and in-laws, we're becoming a father, brother, and in-law program, which is what we'd like to see. That's where the support comes in. That's perfect. Funneling our own people in through the industry. Yes. And keeping it diverse and making sure it stays diverse and inclusive. Yes, inclusive especially. That sounds fantastic. There are several ways that you can help, but the one today is, what is the cost of a person going through the program? We talked about how long it takes to get through, and that's about $12,500 because we're supporting them for their first three years. So with the $12,500 per person, we're offering classes of 25 people per class, and we're doing this four times a year. This is where your investment can help us continue to train this number of students. And the demand is great. We'd like to increase that number over the next years because we have how many people retiring every year from the trade? Oh, yeah, the construction industry is losing that top level of journeymen. Um, if we roll into this program with the new um, highway bill plan and all the stuff that's coming down that measure, we're going to have a need for workforces and apprentices that are just through the roof. We just don't have the, 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 the workforce right now. So programs like this absolutely help the industry. And infrastructure packages are coming down, so that's even more work. So the demand is great. The need for this program is amazing. So we need your help so that we can train more people to make sure that this infrastructure work. Coming down the pike is actually gonna happen with skilled, qualified workers. Exactly. So, you know, as you were talking, I don't want people to get confused. So we were talking about the stats on how many of the people are formerly incarcerated, but what are the full stats of Constructing Hope demographics? Constructing Hope demographics is 100% low income. All of our people sign up to come through the program and we work closely with the state employment office. So that's where we verify income. However, I can say our, our statistics are anywhere between 66 and 70% formerly incarcerated. So there is a large group of, of community members just because our program is here and visible that have the opportunity to stop through the door and say, what do you do? And so with that, we're, we have a summer youth program where we're introducing youth. We have our adult program where everyone's low income. And we're hoping that this summer youth program where we're talking to kids in the, in the high schools between the ages of 16 to 19, they have an opportunity to do five weeks with us with the stream hands on. When they complete that hands-on, they have the opportunity to apply directly to Northwest College of Construction, oh, wow. who is a partner, again, helping us with introducing construction workforce to youth and people of color, as well as they have the opportunity to come directly into our adult pre-apprenticeship training program. So that's basically how we recruit. Thank you, Pat, for that. Uh, I just want to remind you all out there that a donation to Constructing Hope, that's a donation to the community. And this is actually a donation to the industry. Uh, so thank you very much for playing and participating. Um, remember that button on the right hand side of your screen uh, because we really could use those donations. We need the skilled workforce. That is something that you are providing. And again, thank you. The industry is at a shortage. You've heard that a couple of times. Um, we really need these people. And so we need your support so we can make sure they can get through this program so we can get them onto our job sites. And then finally, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to our board. Yes. We have a fantastic working board at Constructing Hope, and we spend a lot of time, whether it's looking at our building for remodel, looking at the logistics of our program, or how do we get better at including organizations and groups like Coffee Creek, 
who hopefully we get into really soon to start pulling more of the women in that group into our organization. So with this board, as active as they are and a strong part of it, I wanna say thank you to all of you because yes. you've been absolutely fantastic and wonderful. And with that said, I will let Pat say the final thank yous. Well, without you, we would not have this program. I've had a very dedicated board. This program has been around since 2009 as Constructing Hope. And graciously through the support of the board of directors is how we have survived. So we do need your help. It has to extend beyond the board of directors and a few other funders. So anything that you can give will help us create a career for a low income person to change their generational wealth. No more welfare, no more asking. They can do it on their own. Pat, do you wanna give us our final close? Everyone, I am so thankful that you took the time out to join us today. We cannot thank you enough and we cannot do this work without you. So one thing that we'd ask you to do, please follow us on our website. And thank you so much for taking the time. Have a good evening. <laughs>